the, for cosmological implication of hidden scale invariance, Professor Archil Kobakitze. Yeah, okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks to Harald for, and the other organizers for inviting me to this conference again. And I also want, uh, would like to thank uh, Jusuke and Manfred for very insightful talks on the same topic. So that frees me um, from putting extra effort to motivate uh, my talk. Uh, and as you, as you know, sometimes it's the hardest thing to do. <laughs> All right. So, uh, I hope still that I'll, I'll give you some uh, extra uh, twist to this uh, model building related with the scale invariance. Um, and that's essentially the works which we are doing at Sydney with my students uh, and some work uh, which is still in progress. So just uh, I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So this is the outline of the talk. So I'll be talking about uh, uh, Higgs and naturalness again. Um, then I will um, discuss uh, essentially a kind of benchmark model, a so simplest uh, extension of the standard model, which incorporates uh, light dilaton in the spectrum um, as, as a prediction. And then I will talk about the cosmological uh, history, I mean the cosmological extrapolation uh, back in time, how the electrovic phase transition proceeds. And you will see that although the model is uh, extremely close to the standard model, which I will discuss, um, but the cosmological history is entirely different. It was quite interesting consequences. OK, so uh, this, is, this is a slide we all saw. Um, this is a slide which is a pride of experimentalists and, uh, um, and uh, concern of theorists. So you see here uh, uh, um, uh, different channels for the Higgs decay and different production channels. Um, it's a cross-section uh, times branching ratio normalized to the standard model predictions. And you see that within the, within the error, uh, this is all consistent with the standard model. Uh, of course, the errors are large still in certain errors. Some of the couplings we don't know uh, yet. And so there is a plenty of room uh, for BSM. But what we see here uh, is that, that the uh, Higgs boson, which we see, is pretty much looks like as a standard model one. Um, now, what's, uh, what's the problem with that? So, you know, that for uh, naturalness or stability, electrovic stability of uh, electrovic scale, radiative stability of electrovic scale, this has a different name, so hierarchy problem was one of the motivation for uh, BSM physics at a TV scale. Uh, but what this data gives you is that uh, even the mass of 125, is, it's, it's somewhat um, heavier than the vanilla type of uh, models we were considering in, in the past, before LHC era. And it's somewhat light for the uh, dynamical symmetry breaking mechanism, like a technical or a, and, and, and the like. Uh, and so I learned very uh, interesting um, uh, um, uh, terminology here. That's the P some people with PhD, which stands now for the post-detection <laughs> depression, <laughs> right? Started to question this naturalness and, uh, and the validity of the naturalness uh, principle. Uh, so uh, my personal point of view, uh, which I and presumably many of you share this, is that the naturalness principle reflects essentially our current understanding of basics of QFT. And it should be really taken uh, seriously, because the failure of naturalness principle would mean that some basics can be fundamentally, should be fundamentally reviewed. Um, and I want uh, to illustrate this success of the naturalness in the past, which uh, people tend to forget, uh, by, by, by the well-known example of so-called large uh, number hypothesis. It turns out to be completely wrong, but, uh, but by itself, it's, it's, it's a first account where um, uh, the naturalness was taken seriously in physics. And that, of course, uh, uh, comes from Dirac, uh, who essentially, as I said, the first recognized the importance of naturalness uh, principle, especially in quantum physics. Uh, now, he asserted that all the dimensional couplings, or ratio of masses, and so on and so forth, should be of the same order of magnitude. Um, 
And that's something which uh, you can call strong naturalness principle. And so you may ask why. And the reason is very simple, because in quantum physics, you know, the pair parameters are related through the quantum correction to each other. And you might not, you may not expect hierarchically large um, uh, couplings. And uh, following this principle, uh, uh, in particular, Dirac was concerned why the strength of the gravitational interaction is so small compared to the electromagnetic one. So if you take, for example, um, Newtonian force between the electron and positron and divide by uh, the Coulomb force between the same particles, you can, you can write that expression in this way. And this is a tiny number, 10 to minus 40. Um, and, uh, and of course, the question was why these tiny numbers exist. And he completely accidentally come up, in my opinion, with another tiny number of the same order, uh, called like M Planck divide the mass of the universe and take a square root of it. It's also 10 to the minus 40. Okay? So this looks like a complete numerology, but based on the principles which he believed, he said that those two quantities has to be related in certain fundamental theory. All right? And as any, any principle or symmetry principle or consideration, we have all these predictions. And that's which differentiates physics from anthropic reasoning. Um, and the prediction here was that since the mass of the universe per se is changing with time due to the expansion, you have to compensate that by its change in the Planck mass or the Newton constant. So the, there's a prediction, clear prediction, that, uh, that Newton's constant has to vary with time, but it turns out to be a wrong prediction. So, uh, and so this, this hypothesis doesn't work. So immediately after that, in 1961, I think Robert Dicke proposed anthropic explanation of this, of this fact, which I, I, won't, I won't talk much about this. But uh, it turns out that if this is, uh, is not 10 to minus 4, you can't fuse hydrogen in the stars, and, and you can't produce uh, elements, and so on and so forth. But as I said, all anthropic considerations are just observations, right, the explanation, and we are after explanation. So I'll continue with this. And now, what, what lesson we can learn here, of course, is that, of course, this particular example of naturalness, uh, pre application of naturalness principle fails. But it may fail because we're applying the principles, fundamental principles, to non-fundamental objects, like the mass of the universe, and so on. And I may say a very brief remark that maybe the cosmological constant is the same story so I, uh, uh, in this context. Anyway, uh, so what, what is remarkable is that we know today the answer to the Dirac's question. And it's entirely based on the dynamical symmetry considerations. Okay? So uh, this is due to the thought, and, uh, so the so-called technical naturalness, which uh, asserts that the dimensional parameters can be small if they are supported by the symmetries. Okay? So they can be radiatively stable. And we know that the ratio of electron mass or, uh, and the Planck mass is much smaller than 1 because of the chiral symmetry. If we take the mass of the electron to 0, it will stay 0 at any level of perturbation theory because of the symmetry. Now we know also that the ratio of proton mass and the Planck mass is much smaller than 1 because of approximate scale invariance uh, of QCD and, uh, and the mechanism of dimensional transportation which happens there. So the question is now, again, is to ask whether we can explain why the symmetry considerations and the dynamical mechanism is the same, why the Higgs mass is so smaller than, than the Planck mass, right? So this is the usual hierarchy problem which we can ask. OK, so uh, now I'll, I'll demonstrate this, uh, some genetic theory, for example, you can consider of uh, scalars, fermions, and the vector bosons. And you can ask, uh, which are defined at certain uh, out of scale lambda, the short, short scale physics. And you can just uh, go and compute um, uh, the uh, corrections, uh, quadra uh, corrections to the mass of, of the scalars. So what you get is, uh, is a well-known one-loop formula. And you see that there is the relation here, uh, quadratic sensitivity of the compute corrections uh, uh, computed corrections uh, to the Higgs mass. Uh, the supertrace here denotes the uh, spin-weighted 
sum of different types of interaction and different types of masses which are included in, in your theory. And now, uh, of course, uh, whenever you do this regularization by the cutoff, or whenever you introduce the cutoff in the theory, external cutoff, you have to uh, specify what the cutoff is. Uh, of course, if it's just a tool to regularize your integrals, then you have to renormalize the theory, send that into infinity, and there is no hierarchy. Uh, obviously, uh, there is no quadratic dependence. However, when we talk about the uh, hierarchy problem, we assume, as emphasized by Lindner, uh, that uh, this is a physical cutoff, which encompass a set on high energy, uh, high energy physics, <coughs> fundamental physics, which may relate it with a heavy masses and so on and so forth. So, so the, the clearly now that uh, in this theory there is a hierarchy problem because to have this mass, um, you know, low energy running mass, uh, small, much smaller than lambda, you have to turn the bare parameter, which is defined at a short scale, with these corrections uh, very precisely. Now, so the, this, is a, this is a fine tuning uh, which is required there. Now, according to Tuft, uh, you know, to explain that m s squared is much smaller than lambda, that ratio, we need some symmetry considerations, symmetry which supports this relation. Okay, so. Now, looking at these equations, you, see, you can see that uh, you, I, I can remove completely the corrections if I assume certain relation between the couplings of the theory with the scalars and the masses. In particular, if I assume that the supertrace of the couplings is zero and supertrace of this combination is zero as well, you will arrive, you, you will cancel the one loop corrections, in fact. And uh, uh, actually, that has been known by Pauli a long time ago without, uh, of course, symmetry consideration. But on the other hand, you know that this is just uh, comes up very naturally in supersymmetry. Uh, it, it comes up, you know, uh, multiplet by multiplet. It is uh, satisfied due to the symmetry. Now, it's also remarkable that in softly broken supersymmetry, even without the degeneracy of uh, masses between the supermultiples, you still have solve the big hierarchy problem. So when we worry about the little hierarchy problem, we have to keep always in mind that the big hierarchy problem is solved in supersymmetry. Now, so the quadratic divergences are absent in there. So the quadratic sensitivity to ultraviolet scale in that sense is eliminated. Now, another thing which is less discussed uh, in the literature up until recently, at least phenomenologically, is basically scale and variance. So these two symmetries are not on the same footing uh, for various reasons. But still, if you just say that uh, your fundamental theory is scale invariant, right, then the calculation within the effective theory which you make, you have to match up with, uh, with your fundamental theory, uh, whatever it is, at the cutoff scale. And that implies that this relation should hold at the cutoff scale, necessarily, as, a, as, a, as, a, as if each, the renormalization condition rises in the fine tuning. And so that also eliminates the quadratic sensitivity uh, towards, towards a um, high energy scale. Uh, what remains, though, is that unlike the supersymmetry, scale invariance is, um, is anomalous. That means that it's broken at the quantum level. And that breaking is, of course, introduced the only logarithmic corrections through the anomalous uh, tensor, uh, energy momentum tensor. OK, so this is, uh, this is true symmetries. Now I want to um, give you an overview of very simple model. Um, uh, so again, we are talking about a standard model as a Wilsonian effective action. So this is a very simple Lagrangian uh, everyone is familiar with. So I assume that this Lagrangian is defined at the short scale physics, and there might be an infinite number of irrelevant operators he added, of course, uh, the uh, potential, Higgs potential. And so the first term is a, a constant term, which we call the cosmological constant. Uh, this is a self-interaction, and this uh, Higgs VV. All these are parameters which are depend on the, on the short-scale physics in the Wilsonian sense. And now, of course, as I said, in this particular theory, if you take it at the phase value, there is a hierarchy problem. You have to assume something about your fundamental theory uh, to, to, to try to solve that. So you have to 
think about the enhanced symmetries in there. I assume that the fundamental theory carries full conformal invariance, whatever it is, which is, of course, spontaneously broken at certain high energy scale down to the, down to the Poincare invariance. Right? And then uh, how I do I write the low energy physics, uh, which exhibits this kind of behavior in, in, in the ultraviolet, is just to, uh, I need to introduce uh, Goldstone boson associated with, uh, with this spontaneous symmetry breaking, which is known as a dilaton. Now, you may think that there are five Goldstone bosons which I have to introduce due to this breaking. However, uh, as it's well known, the special conformal transformations uh, have a redundant Goldstone degrees of freedom. All, all they can be expressed through the dilaton. So there is only one dilaton, scalar degree of freedom, which is associated with that break. So if you assume that the ultraviolet physics somehow uh, is, uh, is conformal in invariant, whatever it is, and the conformal invariance is spontaneously broken, then you have to incorporate in your low energy Lagrangian that dilaton field. And the way to do that is, is well known. You know, you could described in the editorial lectures by Coleman. In a nutshell, you have to basically promote all the mass parameters in your effective theory to the, to the dynamical uh, dilaton field. So once you do those uh, rescalings, you will get, instead of this potential, the effective theory, uh, this potential, which now includes also the dilaton field, the Higgs and the dilaton field. And, uh, which, which uh, manifestly scale invariant, the globally scale invariant. OK, so uh, now you see that the couplings uh, depend now on the dynamical dilaton field. And of course, that dependence can be found through the renormalization group equations. right? So you can expand uh, in Taylor series around arbitrary renormalization point, a mu, and, and get this uh, infinite sum over here. And these uh, essentially are beta functions. Uh, for the corresponding couplings. This is a beta prime and so on. Now, please note that uh, the beta functions are, of course, proportional in the loop ex expansion uh, are always of order of h bar. A beta prime is of order h, h squared and so on. Okay? So in, in essence, that uh, expansion encompasses also the kind of uh, expansion in the h bar. Now, if you do that with all the couplings, of course, at the lowest level, you can obtain the famous interaction between the dilaton and the, and the metaparticles also uh, through the anomalous um, trace of energy momentum of, of standard model. OK, so this is a model which I want to discuss, a very simple model, extension with the dilaton. And what I want to do is just to find out the, what are the extreme and the minimum um, the <coughs> Uh, of this configuration in low energy uh, approximation. OK, so what we do is just minimize, extremize the potential. Uh, and, um, and also, the extra condition which I would require here is that the cancellation of the cosmological constant, uh, 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 of the co cosmological constant, the vacuum energy. Now, in, in the scale invariant theories where you're not allowed to the, add the constant term, that uh, means that there is a certain relation between the couplings you have to assume. Now, so all these three conditions now gives me uh, one condition where this coupling constant uh, of, the, of this term, of the dilaton self interaction, should be zero at the lambda scale. And the lambda is defined by the VV of the dilaton. Uh, but also, uh, the fact that I want the cosmological constant to vanish at the minimum uh, tells you that um, the beta function evaluated at that point has to be zero as well. So this is, this is kind of all-loop all result. I'm not talking about the perturbation theory. And the rest one defines the ratio between, between the two VEVs, the Higgs VEV and the dilaton VEV, and it's expressed through the Self -cup, uh, so the coupling between the dilaton and the Higgs boson evaluated again at the scale lambda. OK, so we call it a uh, hierarchy parameter. Now, assuming that this is small, you can explain that the hierarchy is small between the VV of the dilaton, which set up the uh, ultraviolet scale for the effective theory 
and the Higgs VEV. Okay, in this uh, simple setting. Now, it can be this small, it can be small naturally because any uh, with ascending psi to zero means the comp complete decoupling of the dilaton up to the gravitational effect to, uh, from, from the standard model, meaning that that can be naturally uh, be small. All the, all the radiative corrections are proportional to this coupling. All right, so what then? You can, of course, compute the mass spectrum. It's very simple. Uh, and in the limit of large hierarchy, small psi, you'll find that the Higgs boson has exactly the same form, mass, as in the standard model. Uh, the interesting thing about the dilaton is that the dilaton mass vanishes at one loop level, and it appears only at two loop level, so it's proportional to beta prime. And by itself, it's proportional to this hierarchy parameter psi multiplied on the Higgs mass squared. So it naturally predicts a very light dilaton related to the hierarchy, the assumed hierarchy, uh, what you have. Also, the mixing angle between these two neutral states is also very small, and it's the square root of uh, this uh, hierarchy parameter. So what you have in, in reality is uh, the theory where the, there is a very light state, which is almost the garbled from standard model. So, okay. Now, of course, uh, one has to check that this uh, extra moon, which I find there, uh, is, is actually the local minimum uh, of, uh, of, of the potential. And that requires of renormalizing your theory down to the low, low energy scales uh, and then checking the masses. It's uh, quite remarkable that uh, this renormalization and the parameter area where you can find that uh, this minimum which I found is a local minimum, that means that the square of the masses, physical masses, are positive, uh, is quite limited and quite sensitive to the top quark mass. So this is, of course, very you know, rough calculation, one loop calculation of uh, RGEs. And so what you can find out that if you just match up the standard model blindly with, uh, with your uh, theory, ignoring high, high, uh, higher order operators and so on and so forth, is that, that the scale, uh, which is consistent roughly with, uh, with the minimum, is 10 to 19 GeV. So it's, uh, you, can, you can predict kind of that scale up to the large theoretical uncertainties. If you say that, then the dilaton mass is predicted to be uh, 10 to minus eight electron volt, okay? Now, you may ask whether this uh, dilaton is excluded already. Uh, and of course, I mean, it's very hard to look for those particles at, at, uh, at LHC, at collider physics, and so on. You have to uh, look for them by other means, for example, from fifth force considerations. And this is a you know, summary slide which I borrowed from, from this reference. And what you see that, uh, for example, just from inverse square law consideration, essentially there is no restriction for that particular dilaton uh, with the Planck suppressed uh, constants to the, to the rest of. Um, but of course, uh, uh, the dominant, I think, uh, interaction with the matter must be computed more carefully because it comes from the dilaton interaction with the uh, gluons rather than rather than the direct couplings. So, um, now, okay, so with that model, now as a, as a benchmark model, I want to go and discuss uh, what happens in the early universe in, in such kind of theory. Uh, because the question is quite non-trivial. Because well, first, what you can observe that if you look at the Higgs dilaton potential, um, the energy density at the origin at <laughs> at the minimum which we want to live in are degenerate by the assumption that I want to cancel out the cosmological constant. Okay, so that degeneracy of course are, is lifted by two loop uh, effects only. That's where uh, this flat direction you know, turns into the barrier uh, and that the two loop, uh, uh, and the two loop, uh, the dilaton mass is generated. Now, Therefore, in early universe, of course, you have a thermal correction on top of that. And actually, the thermal corrections are completely dominate over the, at higher temperatures over the 
quantum corrections, because the thermal corrections also break the conformal invariance. And so the thermal uh, barrier is also generated, which actually implies that the critical temperature where the phase transition can happen is actually the zero. Okay? So that implies that you, you may stuck in that vacuum, you know, in the trivial vacuum, and uh, you might not have the phase transition per se if you could just consider the electrophilic sector. Okay? So that, that's the kind of problem and non triviality with this. Now, the answer comes that once the universe cools down to the electroweak symmetry, we come to the QCD sector, where we have another breaking of um, uh, conformal invariance due to the QCD and the chiral invariance due to the QCD condensate. And it turns out, as has been pointed by Witten a long time ago, that, that those QCD condensates are instrumental to drive the electroweak phase transition per se as well. So in this picture, very unorthodox, Electrophilic symmetry is unbroken up until the QCD phase transition. And the QCD phase transition drives the Higgs field out of uh, the minimum. OK? So you can, you can, you can, you can do uh, the calculations uh, with this, right? writing the thermal potential now on top of uh, the potential which I was showing before, and, uh, and analyze this potential. So what you see again, that uh, uh, this flat direction which I was talking about before. So this is the VV of the dilaton field and the VV of the Higgs field. Now it's corrected by the thermal correction here. This is the thermal correction break also, conformal invariance. And, uh, and uh, so as you can see, uh, the potential then becomes expressed in terms of a Higgs field is like this. And you can check that this combination over here is positive at, at those energies, the large scales. And so the Higgs field is stuck in the minimum h equal to 0, as I, as I was uh, telling. So this is an explicit check you can do. Uh, now, but again, uh, uh, below the QCD phase transition, of course, we have the quark condensate in the game. Uh, this is a typical dependence, thermal dependence of uh, of QCD condensates on the temperature and the number of uh, flavors, massless flavors. And then you have, of course, the Yukawa couplings, which, uh, which create the Tatwell term for the Higgs. And that's where you know, the origin tips, and the Higgs basically rolls down uh, classically toward its minimum. Uh, we leave it today. So this is the basic picture. You can quantify that in a, in a more uh, carefully. For example, looking here is the uh, at, uh, um, uh, potential near the, uh, near, the, near the QCD phase transition temperature with six massless flavors of quarks. And you can see that as temperature goes down, uh, you know, the origin tips down, and the Higgs field rolls uh, classically uh, down to its minimum. OK, so now this is, this is the basic picture which we found. But why this is? But there is more interesting stuff which comes uh, with that. Now, as I said, uh, down to the QCD phase transition, the chiral phase transition, which I mean, uh, uh, the all six quarks are massless, unlike the usual QCD consideration. And it turns out that the QCD with six massless quarks undergoes a first order phase transition, unlike the standard case. Which two flavors, and maybe three flavors. I mean, we'll discuss that just look at. Um, now, so it's clear that in this case, the QCD phase transition with six light quarks uh, would be first order phase transition, which has very significant implications, uh, which partially were discussed by Jusuke. Uh, one of the thing is that, uh, so since this transition now proceeds with the nucleation of the bubbles of QCD condensate, those bubbles can uh, can produce uh, stochastic background for the gravitational waves. Now, this is something we a work in progress. So I can't give you exact numbers, but you can estimate roughly the peak frequency of those waves just by com you know, taking the inverse of the Hubble volume or the, or the size of the bubble uh, at that epoch, the you know, 130 uh, MeV temperatures. And so it turns out to be 10 to minus 8 hertz. So Certainly, this, if, if this is correct, uh, then this uh, cannot be probed by LIGO or LISA. 
but it can be probed by means of the pulsar timing techniques. So this is quite a limited area, um, uh, for example, a telescope. Uh, the interesting thing is, uh, of course, also the possibility uh, through the bubble dynamics production of primordial black holes. Again, the estimation only of the horizon size black holes produced at that time tells you that that black hole should be of the order of solar mass black hole. Now, another very interesting possibility, which we're also investigating, is, is the possibility to have the QCD uh, baryogenesis in this case, even within the standard model without extra CP violation. So I don't have really much time to talk about that, but these are, these are all uh, quite interesting implications. Okay, let me, let me conclude on this. So the scale invariant theories predicts, a, well, that class of scale invariant theories which I described predicts a light fabled double dilaton. Electrovic phase transition is necessarily driven by QCD chiral phase transition, and Oker said about 100 MeV. And the QCD phase transition is firstly, strongly first order, so we would expect the gravitational waves, black holes, and potentially successful cold baryogenesis at QCD scale. And of course, the detection of light scalar like, like a dilaton, uh, like the one I described here, and these uh, astrophysical evidences will be um, of a very strong evidence for fundamental role scale in minus which it plays in the particle physics and also in cosmology. Thank you. Thank you very much. does not remain massless since it is a Golson boson of uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking of scale symmetry. The scale invariance is not exact. It's uh, broken but, by quantum. But this, I think, depends on the regularization that you use. In principle, you can keep the scale invariance by uh, introducing coupling to the dilaton with any scale, including the normalization scale. Well, once I, once I fix the ultraviolet scale through the VEV of dilaton, I don't have the choice in the effective theory. So this is a particular scale of models. I mean, we can discuss that. But once I, th once I assume that uh, my standard model is an effective theory, right, with a certain lambda scale, which is fixed through the VEV of the dilaton, low energy scale, it just renormalizes as, as it is, and it, it contains the anomaly. But still it's zero at one loop. It's still zero at one loop is a particular thing. If you assume the vacuum energy vanishes, then it's zero at one loop. It can show that, because it's proportional to the super trace M4 which you have to force to vanish. OK, just because you have so specific pre prediction about dilaton, it's perfectly reasonable to try to detect it in atomic experiments. Yes, because I guess one, so. one megahertz is just a scale for atomic experiments. OK. So it may be manifest itself in, but so if it's, does it constitute dark matter or not? Yes, that's another thing. It may constitute dark matter, but, uh, uh, but the problem is, of course, it's a non-thermal dark matter. So always have a problem how to produce it. But if, if you have the me mechanism of production of that dark matter, they are not thermalized, right? So it so may be... Then, then it might be, a, a, again, the dark matter as well. So if it's dark matter, it may be produced, uh, detected using some kind of effective variation of fundamental constant. But basically, yeah. It affects atomic transition frequencies. You can measure yeah. ratio of two atomic transition frequencies with different dependence on interaction and find it. If it does not constitute dark matter, it may be measured using some isotopic shift measurements or some small effects which are specific for this, uh, this mass of a particle. So it, it's certainly worth trying to, in, instead of trying to avoid <laughs> No, so I'm not, I'm get, not get, trying get to avoid it. Get it uh, getting well, limits why it's not excluded yet. It's better yeah. to devise experiment to detect it. And atomic physics may be a good uh, place to search for it. Certainly. Thank I you. Okay. To I think intend about. to continue with Matthias' actually question. Because uh, when you introduce dilaton, uh, which is spontaneous breaking of uh, scale, scale invariance, then I do not see the reason why uh, uh, quadratic uh, dependence should disappear. because. Uh, spontaneous breaking means that uh, this quadratic uh, diversion would be associated with uh, dilaton coupling. Sorry? Ah, okay. I, maybe. Uh, okay. Uh, it's better now? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, so uh, you see that in this way, uh, technically, I do not see how quadratic dependence would disappear because of Dilaton, because what would, would be that Dilaton coupling would contain the same quadratic divergences. And in this way, what Ignatius mentioned about QCD, it, no, it's relevant the same way, because in this way, when it's spontaneous breaking, uh, you, you can have this whatever quadratic dependencies, but you still can have, uh, I mean, <laughs> reflect that. So you kind of imply that certain stuff disappears, but uh, with this ideology, ideology of spontaneous breaks, I don't see why. Yes, yeah, so what I'm implying is the following. So let, let, let me say the, the genetic thing, because there is, there is a, yeah. some technical thing there, right? The generic thing is the following. So there is a, there is a breaking of uh, conformal invariance in certain, in certain sector of the theory. But the low energy sector to this is, is, is coupled very feebly. That's an assumption. But that feeble couple, you know, the, and, and then the breaking proliferates from that hidden sector to the visible sector through these interactions. And those interactions in this particular sense are, are, are the interaction between the dilaton dilaton and the Higgs field, which is this psi parameter, which I assume to be very small, OK? So, so in that, in the, but it is, in technical sense, it's small. So, no, no, in, in, at this level of effective theory, this is kind of nonlinear realization of this. It's, oh. I just want to comment that uh, a long time ago, uh, um, Roberto Pecce, Christophe Betterig, and myself studied uh, the model of uh, sta the standard model uh, under scale invariance. Yes. Okay, and in particular, we used all these formulas with the dilaton, and uh, we published a paper, uh, which is well known in the literature, uh, in which we realized uh, that if we would like to use this model in order to get the vanishing cosmological constant, then we get fine tuning in, in, the, in, in this theory. Yeah. And in fact, uh, this uh, issue was uh, later uh, discussed by Weinberg in, the, in his famous uh, review, right? So the question is whether the, the kind of equations that you have written in which you uh, uh, assume that you are in the minimum of the potential and at the same time that the cosmological constant is zero, whether you also have fine tuning here. Well, because this is, uh, according to, to Weinberg, uh, this is a consequence, a uh, general consequence of the uh, no go theorem, as you know. Cosmological constant is fine tuned. That's, that's right. But it's fine tuned through the dimensionless couplings in the theory. It is fine tuned. Yeah, I, I, I can't say anything. So there is about fine tuning here, right? Fine tuning of cosmological constant okay. is there. Okay? okay, but but the stability of radiative stability of the Higgs mass is still maintained through this. Uh, I may remind I may remind you that I gave a talk here on these problems, in which there are no dilatons of the low mass type. Okay, yeah. because of the spontaneous breaking inside, generating, for instance, the QCD condensate acts on all scales, including the mass of the dilaton. So this is excluded, according to me, in the way you discuss it. That's, uh, that's yeah. what I simply remarked. I think, uh, okay. I think yeah. we, we can discuss it further. But what I want to say is that uh, uh, the case of the strongly I mean, the question about why don't we have a dilaton in QCD, pure QCD, for example, you yeah. can ask it. Yeah, the, the, the answer is very simple. Because the beta function there is governed by the strong dynamic. And the scale ex explicit breaking of the order of the dynamical scale. And so what you get is a very heavy dilaton, you know, sigma I meson or whatever. Look, I but was this more, I'm sorry, but I was more serious. This does not happen. Finish. OK. Yeah, you don't listen. Last question. Akhil, uh, would you agree with me that uh, there has only ever been one successful uh, application of the naturalness principle in the sense of agreeing with experiment? Successful application of, natu bring of the naturalness of the naturalness idea, yeah, which agrees with experiment. There's only ever been one. Well, we, and we, that we, is we understand. Yes, that right. is the Glashow-Iliopoulos-Miani mechanism. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. You agree? Yes, that I, I do. That actually agreed with experiment. I do, I do. And that was naturalness. Well, but there is an explanation of the, of the electron mass why it's small, right, as well. And I'd say, <coughs> yeah. So, sorry? A model of this, but no, I'm talking about the QED, for example, with the gravity. Uh, right, yeah. Okay, thanks again, the speaker. Thank you.